Hello, 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 beautiful people. Welcome back to another episode of the USL Show. This episode is brought to you by Goals TV, but we'll talk about that in a minute because there's a whole lot of things to talk about. But let's go ahead and jump right into this. Ryan, other than corner kicks, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing okay. Uh, the more significant development this week is that I am now officially a regular at the grocery store that I go to. They do on Monday nights a deal for uh, a large pizza for $9, which is like a fantastic deal. And when I showed up last Monday night, the guy making it, it said, hey, I recognize you from last week. So I'm now a regular <laughs> at uh, the grocery store. And this is what adulthood's like. <laughs> I love this so much. <laughs> <laughs> See, for people who are listening, if you're wondering what the corner kicks thing, I was expecting Ryan to plug his sub his sub stack on his parlay that he put on that we talked about pre-show. But instead, no, I'm learning about him becoming a regular at the grocery store, which is arguably funnier. <laughs> uh, John? Well, I mean, nothing that exciting. Just happy to be here talking about a big week. So hyped for the Open Cup. Like, we're going to get into it, but the matchups are incredible for this round. So really excited to see everything. And I, I guess I'll complain now that I hate that it's five games on Wednesday and 11, or five games on Tuesday and 11 on Wednesday. Like, give me a more even split extended in, I know it's scheduling, but extended in Thursday. Like, spread the love for these teams to have that platform. Yeah, one thing that I always wonder about is, um, or I'm thinking about as someone who grew up in, well, the Bible Belt, Wednesday is always church day. So, like, I'm surprised that a lot of the, the states through there, or a lot of the teams through there, just even do things on Wednesday because that just feels like a bad idea. But I don't know. May, maybe there's some I don't know about. Um, before we get to uh far <laughs> no michael that it does not end after the first round um unfortunately for lexington um but before we get too far i want to just kind of start things off with um some happy stuff um i mean if you haven't been on usl twitter for the last 24 hours um rodrigo lopez son roman um is going under heart surgery and you know, his teammate Luis put together a, uh, a uh, was it GoFundMe? And without kind of letting Roro know, um, basically just was like, I'm doing this because Roro refuses to ask for help, basically, and I'm not letting a friend do that alone. And they he put $25,000 as the... Uh, cost to uh, you know try to help foot the bill for the surgery and anything past and last time I saw it was at twenty eight thousand dollars and that all comes from just the USL um, and lower league soccer community just being genuinely incredible every year we kind of see something like this um, you know the Pain Foundation down Carter Pain Foundation down in Tormenta that we worked with before they raised so much money every year it feels like something happens that the lower league community really just rallies around and says that we're going to make a difference. And, you know, this is going to have a positive outcome because Roman's fine. Like he's going to be good, but, you know, helping a family uh, who has given a lot for us, I, I can speak for the USL show. Roro has been nothing but wonderful to each and every single one of us. And just to give a little bit back is honestly the least that we could do. Yeah, I mean, Rodrigo Lopez has been a totemic figure in lower league soccer since the Republic got off the ground. He's somebody who I've interacted with, uh, with quite a bit, and he's never been anything but endlessly friendly, endlessly considerate. He's a very giving person. And so to see the entire community pay that back, knowing that He's a legendary player. He's a legendary person in, in the Sacramento community, in the community of the USL. It's why we do this. Like we're here to build community, to be a part of community and to see that get paid back in such a lovely way really means a lot. Yeah. I've just, it was just one of those things that we, 
I mean, like I said, we see something like this happen kind of every year where something just kind of tragic happens or a club needs help. I mean, I think a couple of years ago, there was a League Two club that had like all their equipment stolen and like USL Twitter paid for it within 12 hours. And, it, you know, stuff like that kind of happens a lot. And, you know, there's a little bit of we're all victims of the quote unquote wars, right? And we all just try to lift each other up while also tearing each other down because that's what we do. And it's, it's always super cool to see people uplift others. Um, we kind of joked um, last week about Mike Pendleton, right? Of, you know, tearing his Achilles and <laughs> stuff like that. I don't think there's many other communities where random guy tears his Achilles and it becomes a talking point around a community like lower league soccer does. And it's just a cool thing to see as the community grows, like you said. 100%. Um, and this is the worst segue of all time. Thanks to our sponsor goals. But speaking of building communities, people talk about the goals community um, goals. TV. That's who our episode is brought to you by which is the ultimate destination for everything soccer a uh, super exciting news um as a part of our partnership with goals uh, tv we are thrilled to announce an exclusive jersey giveaway for our loyal listeners you you person listening watching you could be a proud owner of your favorite club's jersey courtesy of goals tv now i have seen a lot of comments under the last video that we did and i've seen a lot of comments under the tweet with your goals username guess what that's how you get involved you follow goals underscore tv on twitter you register for free free on goals tv just make an account and just comment your goals tv username that's it and listen this is not part of the ad read but seriously they always say for your exclusive listeners, exclusively for your listeners. And then you'll find out that every single show and every single like YouTube channel has the same 15% off on whatever it is. This is legit just for our listeners. <laughs> like you're the only ones get in on this. And if you're like, what is goals TV? Why do we care? Well, listen, it's more than just a streaming platform. It's a community of passionate soccer fans united by their love of the game. Whether you're into tactical analysis, USL championship match highlights, or uh, compelling storytelling, Goals TV has something for absolutely everyone. So what are you waiting for? Nothing. Do it. Head over to Goals TV. Sign up now for your chance to enter a free jersey. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to show your support for your team in style. Listen, I'm just going to let you know. There's been a whole lot of people who have been putting in their usernames. I might have missed the boat, but it's not too late for you because all it takes is one chance. And also just check out the content over there. Indy 11 is on there. Like they just uploaded their their pre-match presser. I saw that earlier today, and I, that's where I've been catching up with a lot of my indie content. Um, and also the USL Championship just uploads their highlights there. So if YouTube is buggy for you or, you know, sometimes like the, the YouTube upload is just like weird, they're great on goals. So check that out. So also with all that said, because there cannot be enough things to read, I do want to thank our wonderful, beautiful patrons John Hunt, Frank Anthony, Aaron J, Christopher Cohn, uh, Harry Austin, John Fuller, Michael Fuchs, who's been in the chat, Joshua Duter, who does all things with uh, the U, uh, like with protagonists. So, like, please read the Open Cup stuff because he works really hard on that. Noah Telfort, Alberto Aguilar, Jeremy Churchman, who's having a ton of fun with some darkness, smells, and sabotage, and Stephen Howard. Thank you guys for supporting us. Um, speaking of darkness, smells, sabotage, and um, smoke and all that kind of stuff, I want to just go ahead and do a, just a quick little around the uh, around the horn with some uh, U.S. Open Cup. One of the ones that just concluded was, yeah, Detroit City beats Michigan Stars 1-0. Maxi Rodriguez, I mean, Maxi Rodriguez, and... 
it could not have been any better if you're a Detroit City fan. Late match, uh, late match heroics, and <laughs> it's just good stuff. Should we be expecting yeah. a Michigan Stars press release soon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, if you're thinking about that game, right, like Detroit was taking it to them for most of the 90 minutes, and Tatenda Karuva stood on his head for the Stars. He's somebody who's been a real stud in Nisa for a hot minute at this point. You hope he can get a move up based on performances like this. But, I mean, full credit to Detroit, who, with some squad rotation, in a game that means a lot to that fan base, this historic rivalry for them, they played their game. They weren't afraid to have that offense first style. Maxi had an unbelievable 90 minutes and he deserved to get the winner in the end. The fact that they were able to light off the smoke against this team in the open cup, kind of repeating that scenario, pretty much storybook for Detroit city. And this was a Michigan stars team that had two MLS players in their starting 11 with Justin Merrim and Harrison awful as well, really doing that Charlotte FC to uh, Michigan stars pipeline and for the match, but uh, Hunter Wilson's red card certainly changed things for that to give Detroit the man advantage to go get their goal before they getting a red card themselves to play 10 on 10 soccer towards the end of the match. But just another uh, feather in the cap for Detroit city, getting a victory over their in-state rivals and just one of the you know, really iconic just uh, lower division open cup rivalries that we tend to see uh, year after year. Let's go ahead and talk about what uh, what Aaron J. Smith video production just put into the chat. Yes, we did have a goal in Charlotte, another one, where we have it's four to three to Charlotte in extra time, which I did say that Charlotte could easily beat um, this Rhode Island team in our USL show Discord, but – I thought it would have been off a scrappy 1-0 win off the back of Austin Pack. I thought that would be how they would do it. Not a 4-3. Granted, the game's not over, but it's an extra time, and it's 4-3. to three. And you're looking at a brace for uh, Orbregon. Oh, I always mess up that name. So sorry. Orbregon, you and then, it. Yeah. Yeah, nailed it. Uh, Alvarez and then uh, Mboyu. <laughs> um, and then you have – McGlynn, Messer, and Holstead. Holstead finally getting his goal, by the way, after hitting yeah. the bar like 17 times in the opener. Um, it's it, This has been an incredible match so far, and a part of me just wants to see Rhode Island equalize just so we can keep it going. But also, Charlotte has deserved this. Rhode Island went with, I mean, almost an entire second unit with the lineup. This is a team that's been really stout defensively in the league. Like, you can quibble with the fact that Albert Dick was really the only guy who's scoring for that team, but they've been flawless in their own half other than kind of the exception that was the Tampa Bay game. And if you're thinking about what they allowed in that one versus what the independents are getting tonight, it's balls over the top. It's these fast breaks that are a little bit shaggy, and they're kind of just trying to take advantage before this Rhode Island team can find their shape. The independents are such an interesting team right now. Like they've looked really bad in most of their games and Austin Pack has been standing on their head. If you can maybe start to string more of these sorts of chances together, like getting a Buyu on the break, getting Alvarez connected in the midfield, this is a path forward, but like as an individual moment as well in the open, huge to see for them. And I would like to uh, say you're welcome to everyone who attended and watching that game. I was this close to deciding to drive over to go and attend this match, but figured if I did, it'd end up being nil to nil. And uh, <laughs> as it turns out, it turned out to be a, a exciting fixture. But I mean, you're looking at an independent team who, if they can prevail on this one, would be unbeaten in their last five games across all competitions. And then a Rhode Island team who travels out to Las Vegas in their next match with uh, almost this offensive performance should be enough of a boost to say, okay, we're trying to put the pieces together. If we're going up against a Las Vegas team and who is prone to having an exciting game every so often, it could definitely kind of start or falling into place this next game. 
Charlotte barely beating Greenville, barely beating Spokane, limping against that like country club team from Pennsylvania in the open, and somehow calling that five games unbeaten. That's good stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of what – this is not fair because the offense from Charlotte last year was stunning at times for most of the season, to be fair. Um but this year, it, it feels like the offense hasn't quite clicked. But despite you having the Golden Glove winner going elsewhere, it was widely accepted that that Austin Pack was GK1 in the league last year. Maybe you could say something about him all night, but it was widely accepted Austin Pack was GK1 last year. And He's showing it again this year. He's, like you say, standing on his head. Talk about the other side of this Rhode Island part, though. Talk about GK1. Jackson Lee has been GK2, and he's been standing on his head in his short, young professional career. And he, I, I don't want to say, say he as in he made errors that led to goals. I know every goalkeeper will say they could have done something better. But to go from allowing, what, just one goal in his three professional matches mm -hmm. to, you know, shipping four against a lower division side, I mean, yes, you can look at squad rotation in front of him, but you can also just say, like, welcome to being a professional. Like, that is a real punch in the mouth if you're a young professional that, unfortunately, every professional has to learn. No, and I mean, there is such a difference between being the guy in college, being somebody who's coming into the pro ranks thinking, listen, I'm going to be a backup. I'm going to have a chance to learn from somebody who knows what he's doing. And then to play a team like the Independents, who for all of the things we want to say about how they've looked in the league, they know how to get it done in a tournament context. This is a team that made a somewhat unexpected run to the uh, title game in League One last year. So tough for Lee. I expect him to rebound. I expect him to have that mentality to be able to kind of get back up on his feet for an important league match next week. Now, something that has been kind of happening, I just want to mention it before we get too far into this just only being an open cup recap. I This is just as someone who watched a lot of Gabriel Alves last year. Gabriel Alves, the center back, is weirding me out. Like, it's it, – I get it. Like, if you want a wide center back who is comfortable with the ball at his feet, I get it. It's weird. It's very bizarre. The issue today mostly came Karif, down Karifa's Yaus, Karif Yaus side on the right. I liked him over the weekend, Alves, at that spot. But in a world where it's him and Georgia Quazera on that side – you're maybe going to be bleeding on the counterattack against the team that knows how to punish that. I mean, Gabriel was better on the attacking side last year, and he was a fine yeah. defender, but sure. he was much better on the attacking side and just feels weird to take him out of it. Speaking of center backs his, on attack. His initiation at that spot has been good, by the way. I know. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. But speaking of center backs on attack, Sean Tosh, like he just continues to just score goals and – I mean, Greenville walk out of Lynn family with a three one loss. Um, it, it, yeah, I, as good as this Greenville team has been, this Louisville side and this Louisville team is just kind of different. And we can talk about this, the Charleston team that beat this Louisville team, and we can have a lot of fun conversations about that Charleston team. But, I mean, when you have Sean Tosh scoring, you have Wilson Harris doing Wilson Harris things. Jorge Gonzalez gets on the score sheet late. I mean, it when you read the kind of just lineup that they put out there, one thing for me that I like is, I mean, Danny Cruz is obviously taking this competition seriously. It's a Greenville seriously because that's a starting 11. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is a starting 11. And for Greenville, frankly, to walk out of there with just a 3-1 loss after they have hung, 
you know, five goals on the two of their last three opponents. I think Greenville weirdly walks away happy about that. No, for sure. I mean, if you, yeah, like you said, look at that lineup. Niall McCabe is probably the, and I mean, Danny found is in net, but everybody else has been a regular starter this season. Lucidy clearly came into this game disappointed with the fact that they went to Charleston and got straight up beat. And they wanted to prove the fact that, listen, we still have a little bit of that mojo going. Credit to Greenville, who's been immense throughout the League One season. I thought their system looked pretty solid, and it went toe-to-toe with Louisville in a way that was meaningful. And it's good to get that confidence and get those reps and stay. We were totally in this game against the best team in the entire USL, possibly. So the Triumph are going to be disappointed to go out, but this is probably about Lou City getting right more than anything. Yeah, Louisville, uh, certainly after their uh, defeat against Charleston, and last time out needed a bounce back performance. And it was mentioned in the chat that it could have been very well just fatigue catching up to them from this kind of fast and furious start to the season. But Louisville with a just dominating performance of this match with three goals scoring in each half. It was really the performance you're looking for out of a Louisville team who, honestly, given the fact that we only have eight MLS teams in this competition, should honestly be looking at saying we can make a very deep run in the Open Cup and possibly even win the competition. Something small that doesn't really matter, but I did see Louisville fans mentioning it. Kind of fun after all these years seeing Tyler Pollock go back to to Lynn Family State Stadium and once again just be the opponent long time uh you know with with FC Cincinnati and then just for him to go back to Lynn Family I think the first time actually at Lynn Family him going to Louisville that's not in Louisville Slugger that's just fun <laughs> I, like that is just fun to me to see to see him make that return and wasn't that wasn't Louisville's thing that he was always the worst Pollock brother that he was the worst of three wasn't that always their thing? I don't remember that, but that's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember off the top of my head. Um, last score update before we get into the full recap of the of the week. Uh, New Mexico and uh, Lubbock are still tied. Um, so it's it's no nil. It so yeah. Um, let's go ahead and move on. I want to start with the fun one. The Henny Derby was, oh my God, I incredible. Everything about it was incredible. Um, you know, guys like Kyle and Elliot got shine that they deserved. Got they got what they deserved out of there, out of that match. And then, you know, you have Ford Madison going up early. You have just an absolute banger of a, of a bicycle kick coming out for Richmond. And when you watch the stand celebrate at uh, Bree Stevens, like I always love whenever a big goal happens at whatever stadium and you can see the, the camera shake. It happened in Madison. And that was just, it's crazy to think that that's the third tier. It also shows just how important the Derby is, not just to – a couple of fans to all of the fans. And you can also tell that the players are aware of what the handy Derby is because some of those guys don't celebrate like that for normal matches. You can tell the players understood what was at stake. It led to an incredible two, two draw. That was just so much fun. No, for sure. Almost 4,000 fans there in the stadium for what ended up being an incredibly exciting game. I mean, thinking about what you said about the players being aware, guys like Derek Gebhardt have been with Madison for years at this point. Like, these teams have built up a history where this rivalry is starting to mean something and to gain awareness, even beyond the people who originated it, the people who are the Sitgos. I feel like the best rivalry matchups have an importance because the players are buying in, and you really felt that with the game over the weekend. And the quality of the goals, obviously fantastic. I thought both of these teams were unflinching in the way they approached it tactically. Like you saw what Richmond wanted to do with the possession game, driving through lots of connection between Bill Hart and Vinyals. 
Madison continuing to manipulate those forwards, really rely on the wingbacks as drivers offensively. Great game of soccer. Probably a fair draw in the end, if we're being real here, even as somebody who's a Madison apologist. But yeah, just a total showcase of what League One can be. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about just kind of the passion and just how important a rivalry is for Richmond, and you're looking at a Richmond Kickers team who hadn't gotten a result in this rivalry in three consecutive games prior to this point. And if you're looking just from a pure neutral perspective, if you haven't seen either team score or both teams in a match score two or more goals since October 2021, and Richmond for the first time since the uh, end of June, beginning of July last season, has four points over the course of two consecutive games in League One play. And you could just tell kind of getting thing back on track from their season after last year was less than ideal to get a result, to go into Madison's home opening match, into this rivalry, and to walk away with a point out of this and to score two goals. It was a fantastic showcase for League One and a really great, uh, uh, just a really great result for Richmond. Someone that we've mentioned a lot on this show that I have, I am not afraid to tell that I'm biased about. I love Adrian Vilhart. <laughs> like he gets his, he gets his goal and, but he just does so much more off the ball. And I just love the way he plays. He is someone that frankly should have been a star in the championship and even higher, you know, coming off an injury from Tormenta and then going up to Detroit where it just didn't really work out. Man, like Adrian Bilhart could absolutely rip apart League One. It looks like he's going to. No, he's been great. And seeing him build that confidence back up as he's got the playing time and integrated into this team and found the connection within that unit, really impressive. Also, this has nothing to do with soccer. I just wanted to be known that the name Wolfgang just needs to come back. Like, I think we just as a society just need to just accept that Wolfgang is the sickest name. I, w I wish Wolfgang Prentice could have got his real shot in Oakland because he's a name MVP. <laughs> Wolfgang Prentice. Yeah. Um, question in the chat um, that came up, and I figured that this would be a good time. I thought that Rhode Island's a playoff lock. Why are they losing to a League One side? Um, honestly, for me, I was skeptical of what Rhode Island did because I didn't really believe in the depth that they had. I think names on paper on the starting 11 are beautiful. But if one injury happens, where does it go? And as much as I have loved watching Jackson Lee, you can kind to me, I think you can tell that this team was built on Coke Vegas to basically play the midfield. And that's kind of harsh, but like the way that Coke Vegas plays seems like it's how this team is supposed to run. And Jackson can do that, but not the same level as an experienced player like Coke Vegas can. I would even argue that they moderated Koke Vegas to an extent. Like he wasn't quite as often taking up those extreme positions he had in San Diego. But even when he did, there just wasn't enough creativity with the way they built. It's becoming clear to me that they just don't have the creativity that they need in the middle to kind of create chances. Like it's a lot of long balls into Albert Dickwa. It's a, it's a very good counter press, and you're hoping you can create those turnovers and kind of turn that into instant offense. We'll see how that continues to develop. I had this team as like a lower half in the Eastern Conference side. I know the hype at large was largely based around getting Williams, getting Dequa. It's going to be slower than that. Like historically, the best expansion team in the past seven or eight years was Detroit City, who barely squeaked into the playoffs it's just hard for a team in year one. So I think people probably got a little bit ahead of themselves when they thought of Rhode Island. Like I'm fully in on the project. I think this team can be a threat down the stretch, but it's going to take them some time to get into that mix. And also it's the open cup. Like it's built for these kind of upsets. Rhode Island used a very rotated team tonight. Like that entire midfield was new players who barely played. So 
kind of giving them a pass here. Yeah, it's the Open Cup. I mean, you're looking at other teams in the league like El Paso who still have yet to get uh, beyond their first Open Cup match whenever they have played. But even within the league itself, Rhode Island has started the year with four draws on the board, which may not see much in the table at the moment. But when you get down further towards the season, if that's going to be a borderline decision come playoff time, and having those draws versus having three additional defeats or so could make a very big difference. Um, a match that we were going to talk about anyway, because as we all know, our residential Oakland fan, uh, Phil Bakke, was down in El Paso to watch Oakland and apparently El Paso as well. Um, you know, the, we end up getting Oakland winning 3-2. to two, And the question comes in, do you think uh, Brian Clairout should be let go? And... I'm not sold on what's going on in El Paso at all. Um, I don't think this is on, maybe it is, maybe it isn't on clear out, you know, before and before when it was Hutchinson and I was banging my head against the wall because it felt like obvious choices were not being made. I also kind of don't know what you can do with this El Paso squad in its current iteration. And you can say, well, Brian Clairout did that, but also I don't know what a new guy could do with it. So almost it, it, I don't know. I don't think you let him go, but I can understand if people might start raising the question. Can I just say yes? Like he he got the full off season last winter to build this team. It started well and then it collapsed halfway through the year. This team has been bad since last June, July. He had another off season to completely rebuild. And while it's early in the season, you need to get Joaquin Rivas enough minutes to see if he's the missing piece. They've been really bad again this season. I think by and large, you point to the fact that, like, what can he do? He can change formations. He can book Pulak and Yode in the midfield. He can try to moderate what's happening with the wingbacks by having the central midfielders cover that space a little bit more often. It feels like the Locomotive have a squad that should be competitive at the top end of the West. Like, I was sold that this team was going to be a real competitor. And Claire Hout has shown so little willingness to kind of get out of the rigid structure that he's going for. And I think we saw that in the Oakland game as well, where the Roots had a very right-sided attack. They were constantly getting Johnny Rodriguez in between the lines. And there was just never a counterpunch from El Paso to try to counteract what they were doing, get those stops, change the momentum of the game until it was too late. I mean, we're looking at an El Paso team who's winless through their first six games of the season, and this is their worst start in club history, which is, uh, interestingly, you had the start of their 2022 season where they began with also uh, five defeats, but they had one 5 nil victory over Monterey Bay within that time. But here they have one point on the board and just five goals to their name, and I really think they need to get past Omaha in this Open Cup match or else – you're really going to start questioning is the project going anywhere because they just can't afford to keep going down this path. Not when you have Tampa Bay looming. And then honestly on star Wars day on May 4th, they play Colorado Springs. Who's also towards the tail end of the Western conference at the moment. And that very well needs to be a, you have to win. So I guess my question, cause you mentioned changing formation, right? Uh, Bolu in the midfield seems like it should be a layup. And I've mentioned this on here before. Bolu's played center back, but that was out of necessity, not because Legion wanted him to. It was out of all of our center backs are dead. We need someone with a pulse, and Bolu's tall. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I wish it wasn't that simple, but that's kind of what happened. Is the answer just – push Bolu up beside Liam Rose and then pull the wingbacks down just to be fullbacks because I mean, where they're getting killed is on these wingbacks go burr and they're not going back. 
just saying you're not allowed past the midway line and you know unless you are for sure that you can get back i mean go into maybe like a 442 or a 423 think about it yeah exactly think about a team like hartford where you're getting nothing from tristan hodge and joey akpanono at the at the fullback spots right now they've got anderson Asiadu as that number six who's going to sit in you can pretty much copy that and then you've got moreno you've got rebus out on the wide spots who can beat players on the dribble, who have that creativity and that pace to really cause trouble without the help of somebody on the overlap. There, and I mean, I'm like, I'm just an idiot with a microphone. I don't know what I'm doing. Brian Clairhout clearly has a greater insight into what these players can do, who can fit in what roles. He can think beyond what we're talking about right now. Like there are plenty of solutions and the locomotive don't seem like they're interested in any of them. <sighs> frustrating i i want i i don't know i mean can, i guess can i shout when, out oakland real quick also like i mean yeah yeah i mean i that love your rodriguez love, goal <laughs> yeah i i like what delgado's done i this is another situation of doing with what you have and <laughs> delgado always just kind of kind of does it and last year, who knows how much that trade slash transfer, I don't remember what it actually was, um, how much he actually had control over that and whether how much that was kind of above him or beneath him, whichever way you want to think of it. He always just does with what he has. And getting three goals, yes, say what you want about El Paso, but he also constructed this, like, this match to just – berate those weaknesses and it turned out really well i was so fascinated by what he chose to do on the right side because i mean this is a team that's missing a lot of players with injuries there i mean and also the suspensions like let's be real yeah. half of their defense or the defensive starters are out but you he had the confidence to turn teenager Ilya alexeyev out as a starter out of that project is it 510 i don't know how you say it Yes, because yeah. the O is the O for Oakland, not a zero. It is an O for Oakland. Yeah, but like taking a kid out of your youth program saying, we're going to trust you to go against Lucas Stouffer, who's been as good as anybody in the USL, not only that gives you what you need at wing back, it frees Brian Tamakas to play a little deeper at center back, but he still kind of got forward like an attacker. So you're doubling the effect on that side you're still opening up space because of it. I think Delgado is somebody who's working with a roster that if you're just going player for player, maybe isn't the most talented in the USL. And I think the people in Oakland know that. The ability to think on their feet and adapt game to game, it's not churning out wins for fun, but it's getting them to where they need to be to position themselves for a potential playoff run. And I think that ought to meet the expectations for the Roots. Something that I just now remembered as I'm kind of looking back at it, just kind of hilarious that they just threw Yuma on for 16 minutes. Considering the fact that they thought the dude went missing for like half the off season or like, where is Yuma? Is he here? Is he not here? And then they're like, here's 16 minutes, man. I don't know. It's always fun seeing him still kick around, but considering the fact that nobody knew where he was, it's kind of funny that they're just like, here you go, pal. It was his 100th USL game, and they just like, Yo, get off the bench. You're you're doing it. <laughs> He's only been there for a hundred matches or a hundred matches. That's what they said on the broadcast, I think. He was in He's the NASL here for, like, for a minute. He was an Armada guy. He was Ryo OKC. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking lower league soccer guy. I because I was like I've I've known him for like ten years. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah, he's got a hundred league appearances and two losses in the cup. Brutal. <laughs> 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 All right, let's go ahead, and I want to move on. Let's talk about one Knox versus Omaha. Um, one Knox, they it it kind of was what it was the goals didn't really flow knew who played well and then you get goal of the season i don't i mean the one in richmond was close i mean you don't get bikes that often but 
goal of the season out of Omaha. And when you have a defense as stout as Union Omaha, it, good luck getting through. And, and if you do, knew who's right there, which is just not fair. I've been so impressed with the way that Omaha have kind of adapted what they want to do tactically this season. For all of the success, like they tended to play an open game last season. They really tried to push those wingers. They got Dolabella involved in the forward line. They weren't a. I mean, they weren't a team that was in shootouts constantly, but they weren't necessarily afraid of that setting. This year, it's a little bit more of a cautious approach. Pretty much using a back three in this one, which I found to be fascinating. Blake Malone, the return, he's been immense in that back line. So impressed with him. I thought Meshach Jerome has been good as well, kind of getting a second life there with uh, what's really turned into a group of a lot of XL Paso guys. But to do what they did against a one Knox team that's kind of been tearing you apart for fun has, was really impressive to see. And I know Knoxville short of um, Angela Kelly Rosales, which like reigning player of the month, that's a big deal. But full credit to Omaha, full credit to that Steven Dos Santos goal. Yeah, I mean, Omaha still remains unbeaten against Knoxville head-to-head -head in the league uh, all time. And, and like as we saw from the end of last season, Omaha just went on an absolute tear to end the year. And they seem to be starting this year similarly with uh, two victories in the league. And then a match uh, against El Paso here in the Cup tomorrow that I'm surprised the odds have them as underdogs in. Why? Like, <laughs> I mean, just uh, forget about form, forget about for both teams. Just think about history of El Paso. El Paso does not do well in the cup. Like, except for last year, I can say the same thing about my club, Birmingham Legion. Until last year, they didn't do well in the cup either. I wouldn't, you know – if you were to put a gun to my head last year, I was like, there's a chance we might lose to Chattanooga FC. Like, it could happen. And that's just, I don't know. Um, so, yeah. Um, so one thing that has been really interesting with the Junior Omaha side, if you are a championship person, PC, or just literally soccer, PC just in the midfield, uh, a different player. I completely understand different player, which I want to give a shout out to this guy because of his banger of Louis Hill. But he's not the he's not a Louis Hill replacement. But if you're going to swap out Louis Hill for somebody, PC's not bad. It's that same level of class and leadership, that way of kind of calming the game down, like. Whenever heel gets a touch, you're confident you're keeping possession and the ball is going to go somewhere useful. PC has that same aspect, but he brings a little bit more defensive grit. He's somebody I adore and think is like historically underrated. So love seeing him in Omaha flourishing. Yeah, so let's go ahead and move on through. And just real fast, I want to... Go ahead and go to our tactics show for the week, which is Phoenix Rising, um, making some fun changes that you talk all about as I have struggled to put together a decent production. Been a back three team essentially since Mongera took over the coaching job. And Danny Stone carried over that system into the 2024 season, albeit to less success. So his switch into a 4-2-3-1 this weekend was crucial in the way that Phoenix was able to get results against Colorado Springs. You see the balance that Phoenix could get from their new shape there. Their heat map was very much dispersed across the pitch in an equitable way. And a lot of that had to do with the role Fede Varela played as that number 10 player between the lines. Here you see him linking play, bringing the winger and right back Lawrence White into the possessive buildup sequence. Varela was essentially the man that the shape uh, catered to. You took off the center back and got that extra player between the lines in the midfield. And he was really brilliant creatively. You're seeing him find spaces in the channels, playing in important passes over the top, 
and ultimately helped Phoenix to create looks downfield. The impact was also felt in the defensive phase of the game. Gabby Torres had a very impressive shift on that right wing. You see him tucking inside to track a center back carrying the ball here. You're going to see him uh, tracking back into his own box in a minute. But overall, having that five-man midfield really made Phoenix a bit more stout where it mattered in the heart of the pitch. I thought their personnel choices were interesting. Danny Stone really trusted what's essentially four natural center backs to do the job in the back line. And the players came up impressively because of the midfield support they got. You're seeing both members of the pivot back here. You're seeing Popping Our Boy step up to cover space. And ultimately, the real game-breaking sequence comes from Gabby Torres coming back, tracking that runner at the possible far side, and making sure that Rising aren't going to bleed chances where it hurts. This was just an assured performance overall. Having that extra body in the midfield made the press make more sense, added a real sense of impetus in possession, and gives this team a format going forward in a way that maybe they didn't have. There was always going to be evolution with Danny Trejo out, with Manuel Arteaga out, and this team is growing in a way that is going to make sense for them to possibly get back into the title mix. And one player that I've highlighted a lot that the USL Championship has highlighted recently, and one person that you highlighted, I'm deeply in love with Marboy. Like, I am so deeply in love with watching him. You can see why they brought him in. You can see why he was such a highly touted prospect through the MLS ranks. And for him to be, what, is it six matches into his professional career? He he does – it shouldn't be this easy looking. Like, it looks so effortless for him. I'm obsessed with him. He's not going to be around for long. I – if Phoenix can continue to build around him and the other players that you mentioned, John, they can be a real deal powerhouse this year. Yeah, I mean, thinking about my boy's role, especially like Phoenix still wanted Lawrence Wyke to get pretty far up that side from the right back spot. You're down one center back compared to what you've been in previous weeks. My boy was hardly challenged in that game. He looked so up to the task in that back four, which, I mean, wasn't even the system he was playing at Clemson. Like, it's a pretty new task for him. Uh, I talked to a couple people from Phoenix today who said they didn't really work with that shape in preseason training at all. So kind of just Danny Stone thinking on the fly and the players executing at that level, really impressive to see. Like, it's been up and down for Rising for a lot of this year, where they have games where they look like they can hang a five-piece on anybody. They have games where the offense looks completely incoherent. The strikers aren't moving. This was a match where the passing patterns made sense. The defensive structure was constantly solid. Things clicked in a way we haven't seen for a full 90 minutes for Rising. Once they get Panos into the mix, once they kind of figure out, okay, how can we do this, but also play Edgardo Rito? How can we continue to weaponize this roster? Like, I think the trajectory can only be good in the Valley right now. And that's what intrigues me about uh, this match coming up this weekend between Phoenix and Pittsburgh. You're looking at a Pittsburgh team who still is trying to find their footing. They only have one goal scored all season alongside four shutouts that they've had on, from their own offense. And then a Phoenix team who, you know, outside of that 3-3 draw with uh, Tulsa that they had, there's been under uh, two goals scored in uh all of their other games. So I think it could really be a f uh, interesting kind of uh, defensive uh, matchup coming up and possibly one that you just bet under two and a half goals. <laughs> just toss that one in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Check out the sub stack. Um, so one thing that, okay, I just kind of want to, just tossing there just real fast with Pittsburgh. Their one goal being Keza's goal where he taunts Louisville and then just continues to get battered is funny. It's just objectively hilarious. Um, at, You know, but 
I don't want to get too far into this preview, but we're already kind of here, right? So I guess it's going to kind of bleed the two in just a little bit, and that's fine. It's our show, dang it. Um, and Pittsburgh, I'm just not sure. Like, I don't know where the goals are going to come from. The defense doesn't look Bob Willie-esque. The, it looks better with Danny Griffin in the midfield because he's one of the best midfielders in the league, and it should. But if you're looking at a Phoenix team who has seemed to find – who has seemed to have found something that looks competitive, I I don't think Pittsburgh has much of a ch- chance – I think it's a really good litmus test for both sides where Pittsburgh has had this run of games where they're not giving up goals, but you, you're right to point out you're not really 100% sold that this is an elite defense. Against a Phoenix team that finally looks like they figured it out, if Rising can put in a good shift and come away happy defensively, I think that's going to mean a lot. Going the other way... Phoenix really has some holes in that team, right? Like you can imagine a pacey forward getting between the channels. You can imagine somebody wreaking havoc in the midfield when you've got Mertz and Griffin and Forbes is that trio. Whoever can adjust and really impose themselves here is going to instill a lot of confidence for me. I, I think probably Pittsburgh has more to prove at the end of the day, but I'm fascinated in the matchup. Yeah, and I ultimately went with uh, Phoenix to win this one as well. Phoenix of their next four games, I think, are really interesting. You have Pittsburgh, then you travel cross country to play Rhode Island before coming back and hosting Sacramento before another cross country trip trip against uh, Detroit City. So a really interesting run of games that Phoenix has on the schedule. I'm taking Pittsburgh for all the reasons I kind of previewed before. I just I like what I saw out of Phoenix. I've to be fair, I've, I've liked what I've seen out of Phoenix all year long. The talent you don't question is just how would it change with a new coach kind of late and losing real deal talent along the way. I think they figured it out quicker than Pittsburgh has. I am taking Phoenix. Um, before we get too far into full on preview, I just want to quickly talk Tampa Bay versus Miami. Um, Tampa Bay gets their first goal via own goal, and it – never really looked back like it was all tampa bay and frankly i thought this was a very surprising result i was not a believer whatsoever in what tampa bay was doing you saw names on paper but i just was not believing in what i was watching and i was believing what i saw was miami and it felt like tampa bay had a point to prove and miami kind of got caught No, I'm completely with you. And Miami, bizarrely in this one, kind of decided to throw out the blueprint to an extent. Like Jordan Ayambilla was really pushing high at left back, kind of almost man-marking uh, Pacific Nyongabire on the wing. What it did was just leave that entire channel wide open for Cal Jennings over the top, which, like, if you're not paying attention to Cal Jennings, I'm not sure what you're doing strategically, And Tampa Bay just worked from there. They had every advantage in the midfield. This felt like a game where they finally started to get the creativity we've expected from the middle. Um, Charlie Dennis was able to get on late in the game as well. Getting him back with full starting minutes is going to be unbelievably important for this team. He's really what they've been missing. On the Miami side, like I know they ended up getting two goals here. That was a gift to them at the end of the day. It was nice to see that they came out of the gates looking semi-all right. I think that it's probably going to be a rough stretch for them going forward, as much as I hate to say it. I mean, this game for Tuesday night had no reason to be as exciting and as high-scoring as it was, but you're looking at a Tampa Bay team who just, they really needed a performance like this one, and they're still one of among two teams in the Eastern Conference right now who still have not had a defeat in the league to start the year, with Charleston being the other one. 
I before I quickly want to discuss Charleston, I mean just real fast because it, what they did was just super impressive. Can I just tell you that my really toxic trait at the moment is just I'm feverishly refreshing the Michigan Stars Twitter account. Like I am just I F5. think that's the responsibility of any fan of American soccer right now. <laughs> Like, it's not good. Um, Charleston. Charleston, it, it looks like for, like, two games in a row where it's like, we – are they good? Defense is, you know, they, they let in some goals, and it's like, what's going on? And then they decide to turn the screws a little bit. They tighten up, and then they're like, oh, yeah, we're still Charleston. And kind of like what I tweeted earlier on this last week, Nick Markanich is that guy, like <laughs> player of the <laughs> week. And he is just so good, man. And last year, I don't think there was anybody's stock hurt more by, um, oh my gosh, uh, Fidel Barajas than Nick Markanich because Markanich was sitting there tearing up the game every time he came on. And then – People will be like, oh, it's the Barajas replacement. He's only playing because Barajas isn't here, and that was when he was on international duty. It's like he's kind of been here the whole time and just been really good, and now he's full-on broken out, certified superstar in the USL. I think it's kind of under the radar that he put up unbelievable numbers last season. I, I think we were probably some of the most vocal Nick Marganic supporters there were phil especially because of kind of the illinois connections but like this is a player who had nine goals and two assists he could play in the middle of the park if arturo rodriguez wasn't available he was able to switch over to the wing and really cut in onto that left foot like we've been seeing so much this year the importance and the effort everything he does within that battery side is so crucial and really, you could make that argument about pretty much anyone in the midfield. Aaron Malloy is the obvious one, the way he sets the tempo, the constant defensive energy. Chris Allen doing all the little things. Emilio Icaza had a massive game against Indy, and he really made an offensive impact. There isn't a ton of depth to this battery side, but every player can kind of fill a handful of roles in a really meaningful manner. And I think Ben Pierman knows exactly how to use that talent to get wins, but do it in a way where his team isn't exhausted in a busy stretch, where they're able to feel like they're a bit replenished, come with that full energy, knowing next man up is here and he can perform at that same level. And especially looking ahead for some of the future games that Charleston has, I mean, you have Tulsa, Las Vegas, Hartford, Birmingham, and El Paso. So in that next stretch, you could see a battery team you know, really try and push themselves to establish a great lead atop the Eastern Conference as they currently have right now a three-point gap over Louisville, but Louisville have two games in hand. And Charleston's just been on a fantastic start to the season. And uh, that result they had against Indy 11 also won another parlay for me. So. <laughs> Check out this one, Check out this one did stuff. get... This one did uh, bet over corners on this one. <laughs> um, before we move on uh, to our predictions, this penalty shootout is stupid for uh, Charleston, Charleston, Charlotte versus uh, Rhode Island. Like, <laughs> oh, our our friend friend of the show, Gabriel Alves, missed. The, the final penalty to lose the game. You hate to see it. We were just talking about him. Poor Gabriel. Yeah, that's the USL show curse right there. That is the US. Poor, poor Gabby. The um, actual worst penalty was Luis Alvarez just fully kicking a field goal. But I don't know. <laughs> the, it wasn't a full on slow run up, but the little tippy taps at, at the top of the box before just absolutely launching it is really funny. <laughs> I, I feel, I, I think Rhode, we like Rhode Island. I want Rhode Island to do well. This is not, not fun. 
I mean, no, like it, it's one of those things that they continue just to give us content. And because like they have so many names that you're just like, we want them to be good, but because they have names that people know, it's easier to pick on them. Like last year at times, it was like we could pick on Las Vegas, but that was just depressing for everybody. Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, also, I think Phil said that it was giving USL championship penalty finals, like finals vibes, and it really was. <laughs> People underestimate that that was just a train wreck. I mean, who? I mean, oh my God, uh, Quay Show last year Show, opening yeah. up with Trina Panenko, <laughs> and it only went uphill from there. Like somehow it did not completely fall apart. Was yes. By the way, that is Hugh Roberts back with the Independence, Andy. It was Hugh Roberts back. Um. Yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into some predictions. Uh, first things first, let's go ahead and go Tulsa versus Northern Colorado. Tulsa, who you just wrote about, um, is dropping Nathan worth it? I mean, you can talk about that yourself. Uh, check out the, uh, you know, check out the, uh, what is it? Uh, you're back for, is that what it's? Yeah, it's just the weekly. I talk about a hand four things usually, and then I can't help myself from writing too much. So it was five this week, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and you talk about Tulsa and like what's going on there. Is the project working early on, early doors? You say no, but Arthur Rogers gets to play his old club in Northern Colorado, who it was impossible for them to to try to replace Rogers and Amon in the same offseason. I think if you try to replace those two players at the championship level, that would be apology. That would be apology impossible. Um, yeah, I. This is an interesting one. I'll be interested to see just kind of the response that Rogers gets from his former teammates, and I'd be interested to see if Tulsa can you know tighten screws and get it there. Yeah, you can finally get it over the line. Yeah, I mean, thinking about Northern Colorado, they've struggled offensively for the exact reasons you laid out, right? Like, you're losing the best striker, the one with the most gravitational pull in League One, like somebody coming off the best individual season, probably the history of League One. Then Rogers, who probably had the best creative season in the history of League One. So that's going to be unbelievably hard to recreate. There's talent here. There's a Cesar Martinez. You've got a healthy Urban Para. I really believe in Eamon Zayed as a tactician. And this team has the pedigree in the Open Cup. Obviously, the, they've got the switchbacks number whenever they play them. I just have a feeling Tulsa is going to get the win here, even if I think that a string of bad results there could reveal some kind of weak underbelly that they've got going on but that will be staved off with the win in the open for now. Yeah, I've gone with uh, Tulsa winning this one in the cup as well. It honestly is probably uh, uh, one of the harder uh, matchups of this round to predict. I mean, you talk about Northern Colorado who has the history of knocking off teams in the open cup like they, they did last season, or sorry, when they beat uh, Real Salt Lake, I believe. Uh, and uh, you, they've already also already won a match in Tulsa when they beat Tulsa Athletic in the first round of this competition as well. So I'm backing FC Tulsa to win this fixture, but it's a very uh, almost of a coin flip uh, decision. I love when uh, teams kind of do the city double or like they keep going back to the same city. I mean, again, I'm speaking on personal opinion or experience. Last year, Legion played both uh, Chattanooga's back-to-back -back rounds. I just thought that was fun. NoCo getting uh, Tulsa Athletic and then getting FC Tulsa is just funny. And I just think it's kind of fun in of itself. I, while it's impossible, like I said, to replace Amon and Rogers, and Tulsa has Rogers. I still believe more in this NoCo project than I do Tulsa right now. And granted, you can say, well, Tulsa hasn't played that much, but that's kind of part of the problem is that they haven't played that much. 
I'm taking Northern Colorado. I'm not super confident in it, but I, if I were to hedge my bets, I think that Northern Colorado just kind of has it more put together right now. Um, next up, we have Las Vegas Lights versus Spokane. Las Vegas Lights, who are pretty good, <laughs> and you have Spokane, who has shocked me. I know a lot of people had them high up in their predictions preseason. I was not a believer and they might be converting me. Louis Hill is also that guy. Um, but just in general, like this is going to be an interesting matchup between these two to see if Lions can continue to do what they're doing in the midfield, see what they can do and try to break down a Spokane team in the back line who has been – they they bend a lot. And – We've seen them break, but it's a lot of bending. But can the lights really take advantage of that? Yeah, I mean, you, you're right to spotlight the midfield in this one. Like, these are probably the two teams that, if you think about who's really emerged as kind of dominant in the center of the park, it's Las Vegas in the championship and it's Spokane in League One. I don't think that the Velocity have enough defensive quality for me to feel confident i don't think that the midfield and the pivot especially can bear what the lights are going to do i am kind of thinking that dennis sanchez rotates this squad a little bit they've subtly got quite a bit of depth in las vegas this year and i think that they're going to use it this week that's leading me towards the velocity getting the win like they've got the quality to break las vegas down I think that they're going to come in a little bit more motivated in their first ever cup run. And Hey, I mean, cup sets happen. So let's go velocity. Yeah. Uh, I think this honestly, and it's a shame it's going to be at 10 30, but uh, another edition of us open cup after dark, but both of these teams have scored in every single competitive game that they've played this season so far. You're looking at a velocity team who averages 1.4 goals a game versus uh, a light team averaging 1.33. I think it's going to be an exciting contest with both teams really going for the victory here. And I have Las Vegas prevailing in the end. So I originally took Las Vegas, but I don't know. I The more I kind of think about it, the more that I'm sort of thinking about, yes, you have your rotations that could probably happen. I'm, you're looking at Vegas taking on Rhode Island this week at home and Vegas with how Rhode Island, how the results have gone. It, this seems like it's an early doors get a result here. And obviously Rhode Island thought the same thing. It, while I'm sure you would say Dennis Sanchez maybe isn't thinking about that. I think you would be stupid to say if he's not noticing that at all. I wouldn't be shocked if it was a super rotated team. I think I'm changing my results and going to Spokane. Um, not super confident in that, but it, it feels the most likely. Um, next up, we have Orange County versus Sacramento. This is just a fun one. This one is just nice and spicy. It always is interesting on the pitch. Um, Orange County, who played one of the most boring matches I've ever watched between uh, them and uh, San Antonio, just an absolute blah fest. I mean, some not all nil nils are you know created equal, and that one was not. Um, and then you have Sacramento, who. You know, again, they're still Sacramento. They haven't been getting the results they've necessarily wanted, but you still sort of see these two as maybe one and two in the West, depending on how high you are in, on Orange County. Yeah, and these teams tend to play pretty interesting matchups, right? Like I'm thinking back to the game last year where uh, Sacramento had the anniversary match at Hughes Stadium and then Orange County just play over the top and get two goals to beat them. Like there is some rivalry here. There's the California connection. I think that Sacramento has really had their foot kind of halfway down on the pedal for a lot of the season. 
they're trying to get wins. They're coming with intensity. But when push comes to shove, I think they have maybe October in mind more so than they have whoever's in front of them in a given week. And I think Orange County deserves credit for coming out and really going hard when they play. Like they're trying to get Morton Carlson's system down. They're trying to integrate the new players. There are going to be frustrating games like we saw with the San Antonio match. But even in that context, like I thought Cameron Dunbar grew in the way that he was able to interact in that attacking line. The chemistry he's developing with Kyle Scott is going to be really valuable. They got a really good turn from Duran Faree and goal last week as well. I, I just think that Orange County has enough to at least end up with a draw here, and that's my pick. But like, if I was following the Kaler rule, I would be picking OC. Yeah, I've gone with OC winning this one. I really almost think it's a shame that the schedule makers have put that both matchups in the regular season between Orange County and Sacramento so early on in the year because I think this matchup would be endlessly fascinating if they played it again in September in the heat of a playoff uh, contention. And I think it's just a really interesting matchup. And you're looking at a uh, Orange County team who didn't concede a goal against Sacramento last year. And I just think playing at home, there's going to be that a little uh, further effort behind them that I'm picking OC to win. This is, again, a soccer thing that doesn't count whatsoever. But Sordo looks uh, – like if you look at FobMob and you look at Sordo's player profile, he looks like an he looks like an FM region player. Like, it doesn't – it's not really anything about him. It's just kind of the camera quality plus the insane afro. It's just like bad region on football manager. Like – <laughs> love this. <laughs> I did okay. I'm sure Kayla, you at least saw the uh, North Carolina game because they played yeah. Birmingham. Did Ezra yeah. Armstrong have that little ponytail thing all season, or is that like new this week? Because I don't I remember. I think that's it. new. I okay. think that is new because I don't remember it at all th this year either. This is like when Evan Conway showed up blonde for a week. <laughs> 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 Um, well, okay, speaking real quick, I'm just sidebarring yeah. hard here. Yeah, Evan Conway is like not playing for North Carolina. He's so good. Is he, he? I don't think he's hurt. I don't think he is. But I mean, I guess the question is: is where do you play him? Well, they started Placias, who's like 17 That's years true. old and has eight minutes in Next Pro. Which, granted, play the kids. Like, love that. Palio was great, but like Evan Conway is Evan Conway. He can contribute. This is true. Yeah, I that I don't know. It felt like that was a match that neither team really cared about winning. I'll be honest. Um, if we want to talk about a boring game, like I'm offended, I had to derail my Sunday to watch that game. Derail Hawks. The match could have been an email. Derail Hawks is good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm taking Sacramento in this. I was, yeah, I was thinking Orange County. I also think that, unfortunately for uh, Colin Sutler, I, I do think that the opposing goalie scoring a goal against you in your house probably does wait, probably does like poke the bear a little bit on Sacramento's side. There probably is going to be a little bit of, are you, we can't we have to get payback on that. Like it's one thing for it to be a last minute header, but the goalie scoring the header, I think there is going to be a little bit of poking the bear. I think that Sacramento is going to really show up. That said, if Orange County comes out of this and wins 2-0, I don't think I'm surprised at all. But it feels like this is a match that Sacramento is going to have a little bit more – desire to win than normal just by the basis on how they lost before there um on the last prediction tormenta versus greenville tormenta who have really just been riding the high hand of ford parker all year long and you may as well he's been incredible 
And then Greenville, who has been equally fantastic, who just got out goalkeepered by Austin Pack earlier this week, and obviously the Louisville City match that happened today. This one should be interesting because can Tormenta really get the scoring going? Can they really go from back to front and really get the ball into the net? I know that sounds like normal like soccer talk, right? Um, you know, to take one from uh, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Rising Nation. I'm looking for some soccer plays here. Um, and but seriously though, like Tormenta, they they really have just been riding Ford Parker and hoping it all figures out. Greenville seems to have it figured out, but these are two kind of demoralizing losses. I think the thing with Tormenta, and you hit the nail on the head, is that they've not really had a normal offensive game. Like, they scored so early against Lexington in a semi-fluky manner that it completely threw off the dynamic. Outside of that, they've been really underwater in terms of the expected goals, in terms of what they're generating. Ford Parker, I mean, listen, if he's going to come in and be that guy, like he's got the advanced stats of somebody who is lapping the league. And that's with Austin Pack having a really good year and Amal Knight having a really good year. Greenville, on the other hand, like they've got a really good process. They're going to have an extra day of rest because they got their Open Cup game out of the way. I think that Tormenta scraps their way to a draw because they kind of have that tendency this year, but it's another one where... I'm probably picking against my better judgment for a Greenville win, but yeah, draw. Yeah, I've selected a draw on this one as well. I'll be very interested to see how Tormenta approaches uh, their match against Miami tomorrow. That could certainly be uh, a match that could see a lot, either a lot of goals and something that could really boost Tormenta through to the weekend, or it could be a result that kind of deflates them and leaves them vulnerable to a loss at home against uh, the Triumph. Both of these teams, when they played each other in the regular season last year, split their three games 1-1-1. One, one, and one. So I, I'm going to go with another draw uh, in this series. Against all of my better judgments, I am taking Tormenta. I, I'll be honest, I don't really know why. Like... It just, I okay, I do know why. It's because Tormenta Stadium has been a house of horrors for Greenville. Like, like there is a giant Albus-sized weight named Bolt on the back of their shoulders, and they can't <laughs> shake him at all. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the albatross around their neck is Ibis. <laughs> like, it is... It is truly a house of horrors, and maybe with Harks out, so does Bolt leaving. I don't know. It's just uh, it until I can see Greenville walk out there with a really just for sure dominating win. I think I'm just always going to back Tormenta. It's just one of those places for him. Um, I have one USL thought before we go, and it's kind of not a USL thought. I've mentioned this before. I think it's insane that the town of Cary, North Carolina, was founded by a man named John Bradford, and that's just <sighs> never brought up. <laughs> <laughs> like, the fact that they're coached by John Bradford and the city was named or uh, founded by a John Bradford, that's spooky stuff, and we need to acknowledge it. <laughs> what... I haven't heard that mentioned on a broadcast anywhere. The team didn't mention their statement whenever they were like, we're hiring John Bradford, which feels like a giant layup that they missed. I I don't know. I, I don't think that's happened anywhere else in the U.S. I love it. It's, it's weird. It's, it's creepy a little bit, but I love it. Is it? I think Jake Levy is the social media guy there. I have no idea if he's a listener, but get on this because you're missing out, bud. I'm gonna email him tomorrow. Like, do you know this? He's gonna. I'm, get I'm gonna circle. <laughs> I'm gonna circle back on another USL thing, and that's a uh, Phoenix Rising Nation, who I think is like the funniest human being going on the internet right now. Like, if you yeah. miss USL memes, Phoenix Rising Nation is kind of the heir apparent. 
Wait, Ryan, there's a John Bradford in North Carolina, another one? Yeah, he's a North Carolina state representative. How many do they have? <laughs> Ironically John enough, this uh, John Bradford uh, from the state assembly is a John Bradford the third. Is he the original? Wow. Is, is he from the original lineage? He comes from the line? <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, like, yeah, uh, Phoenix Rising Nation absolutely cracks me up. I, after I figured out what the account was, I was fully in on it. Because you know how Twitter is. You get the recommended and it just random stuff shows up. Yeah. I got one of their tweets just just out of context and I was very confused and then I just started following and I was like this is awesome I love this so great so great <laughs> <laughs> the the I am unemployed thing the unemployed thing just like the have they considered getting a job and then just seeing that tweet oh so good. <laughs> it's so funny um yeah that that was my usual do you have anything Ryan not USL related. Okay. What do you That's have what I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have for the final thing of the night? Yeah, I guess just kind of uh, things I've been watching. I finished The Bear as a series uh, earlier this week, which fantastic. I'm looking forward to uh, season three uh, whenever that drops later this year, hopefully. Um, I guess then the other two things, Shogun has just two more episodes left in its miniseries, and this one uh, just from – what the episode has been titled is promising to be a really good one. And I'm finally getting into uh, X-Men 97, which is great writing, fantastic story, and just really hits the uh, nostalgia part of just uh, the original X-Men. John? Yeah. Um, boy, I am working through the various movies of David Lynch, and I was able to go see uh, Wild at Heart on Sunday night, which was a movie that won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival the year it got released. And the French were so mad that it, they just booed and walked out. It's starring Nick Cage. There's murder and he's kind of doing an Elvis impression the whole time. It's a trip of a movie, but I had a wonderful time watching it. So yeah, go watch something weird is my endorsement here. The French just kind of seeing something they don't like and just doing some obscene is always just fine to me it's a very i know this one if you're a music if you're a music a classical music person you've heard this before but if you're not here it is um when stravinsky did his ride of, uh ride of spring for the first time it caused an actual riot in paris like it's just a ballet with some weird rhythms and some interesting dancing and they were like we better riot, which no one loves a good riot like the French. So, you know, like, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, I like to I like to keep up with things to try to conversate with the students I teach. And judging by what I have been seeing on social media, I am not excited to watch this latest episode of Bluey. I don't think I'm emotionally ready for that. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm there in that kind of emotional state to deal with that. So maybe I'll wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, you got to be steeled up for it. Like you can't just go in emotionally raw, or you're going to get ruined. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm I'm seeing. And I look one of <laughs> one of my like three and four year olds. They were just like. They're like, we love Bluey, we love Bluey. And I'm like, okay, I'll start watching it. And then it's really got me hooked. And I don't, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's the show. Um, check out Goals TV. Check it out. It's uh, good stuff there. Remember, put your account name if you want to be entered into a chance to win a free USL kit of your choice. Um Check out Back Healed. Check out uh, Ryan's sub stack. It is seriously some really good stuff. Um, what other things should people check out? Oh, subscribe to the Rondo. Seriously. 
subscribe to the Rondo. It's good stuff. It's wonderful formatting, and I live for the meme of the week. I absolutely yes, live. Yes, for that. Yes, is going to the official league website, clicking a newsletter, and there you go. Because Nicholas Murray is official and legit. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening. We appreciate you all. And um, even though he was not here tonight, um, here's Alan's voice. Thank you for watching another episode of the USL Show. The USL Show is now proudly part of the Protagonist Podcast family. Please go to ProtagonistSoccer.com to check out more work. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time.